morning, PVC. Good morning. Good morning, PVC. Oh, Nick Feldman is in the house, y'all. Come on. <laughs> um, he told me to tell you, America is not here. His wife is not, couldn't come. Only Nick. Nick gonna worship with us this morning. If you don't know Nick, get to know him after service, okay? Let's worship together. I would advise you to stand up and worship our Savior together. We have baptism. That's why all beautiful kids are here to witness that. Amen? Amen. So, before the baptism, we have a video for you. I invite you to, to watch. Hey, PBC family, it's your boy Chris Clemens. 
Some of you may know me as a fun-loving, fly-by-the-seat-of-his-pants, tatted-up jokester musician who occasionally golfs with the guys once a year. The reality of it is, until recently, I've just been a wandering believer. I could tell you a million stories, some good, some bad, and a lot of ugly. But the greatest and only story that matters to me now and forever is that of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Trust me and trust him. He has tremendous patience. He gives hope, constant love, and truly has his hands on the wheel of our lives here on earth and in heaven. James 5, 19 and 20 says this, My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings a sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. Through him, many of you in the room have had an impact on my life. Today, I want to publicly declare that through Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, all glory belongs to him. I should not be standing here, but because everything is possible through Christ, I get to. Moving forward, I want to share his beauty with everyone. So with that said, we would love nothing more than for you to join us, you wandering believers who have yet to put your faith in Christ, that leads to his great obedience. Take care of each other, and God bless. What a joy. Hey, good morning, PBC. It's great to be with you. I'm Nick. This is Chris Clemens. You just saw that wonderful video. He's a dear friend of mine. And today's special. We want to remind you, especially if you're new to church, we want to remind you what today is and what it isn't. The Bible makes it incredibly clear. The only way to faith is that God gives it to us. And then Jesus says, I, speaking of himself, am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what today isn't is today isn't the day that Chris is coming to faith. Today isn't the day that God's doing anything magical here in this water. But what today is is an act of obedience because of what we see in the book of Acts, that Chris is getting to show you guys. He's getting to show friends, family, his church family. He's getting to show you and display on the outside what God has already done on the inside. And what a joy that God takes hearts like ours and makes, breathes new life into them. Isn't that a joy this morning we'd celebrate? Today's a wonderful day. Yeah. So for Chris, we have a couple questions. Chris, have you placed your faith in Jesus and repented from your sins? 100%. And then Chris, have you decided to live for him for the rest of your days? Yes, yes, yes. Then for that reason, because of your public proclamation of faith in Jesus and obedience to his word, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Good thing to have people following Christ. We have no baptism. We have no video for you. Let's watch. Yeah. When I was younger, I was in youth groups. I went to summer Bible camp, summer Bible school, and yard retreats with the church in Sonoman where I grew up. But I never actually pursued Christ. Then at 16, I had an experience that I can't explain the day that my little brother Randall passed away. A spark was ignited and I realized, okay, God, you're here. You're in my life watching over me. But I still didn't go any further in my faith. I prayed and believed God was real and I thought that that was enough. It wasn't until I married my husband, hey Chaz, that I gave myself to God. Chaz had really turned to Christ and dove deep into his faith, which at first, I admit, really freaked me out and I rebelled against any attempt that he made to bring me closer to God. I went with him to church every now and then and was eventually pulled out of my shell by having lunches with Alicia and talking about faith, forgiveness, and God with her. Then one Easter Sunday, we were at church and I gave myself to God. But even though I gave myself to God, I didn't fully understand what that meant. And I didn't put in the work to get to know God. Again, I prayed, I went to church, joined small groups, and I thought that that was enough. And then I lost my older brother, Tommy. He wasn't a believer and it haunted me 
knowing that he didn't know God. I had so many questions that I didn't understand to the point that it made me scared of God and I started to close myself off to God. Then Chaz suggested that I reach out to our church community and members of our small group at the time and a personal friend of his. I felt like I needed something, that I needed answers somehow, so I agreed. In doing so, I was able to see God, the good in God again. I had reached a point where praying and just going to church wasn't enough anymore. I needed more. I need to know God better. So I joined groups, I joined Bible literacy groups to help me understand God's word. And I'm diving deep and trusting God with all that I am. And it feels good because I know that it's the right answer to everything that I've been seeking. What a joy this morning uh, to be standing here in the baptism tank with Shaney. Let me do this, Shaney, so people can hear us and not hear that. There, it's a, one of those things. And uh, I remember that Easter in 2019 when uh, you came out from the worship center after the service and wanted to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior and make Him Lord of your life. And it's been a journey since then, hasn't it? Yeah, and coming to this point, and uh, I don't think you could have a more proud husband. He might be crying, I can't tell for sure. Uh, but what a joy to be standing here with you in this moment where you're taking a step of obedience to Christ. And so just a couple of questions. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Excellent. And because of that, it's your desire to show everyone here by baptism that you want to follow Christ the rest of your life. Yes. Excellent. Well, because of your faith in Christ, your proclamation and the word of God, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's take our glasses off together. Amen. That was awesome. Would you do that again one more time? For God's presence in here. Hallelujah. Let's keep singing. You want, you want to stand up again? Let's keep worship our Savior together.
Hey, good morning, PBC. What an action-packed morning uh, this morning of emotion. You guys can have a seat. Hey, I'm going to do a quick poll. Uh, it is August 20th today, I believe, right? And uh, for some of us, we've been back to school already. Uh, other schools are getting ready to start this week. Uh, parents in the room, how are we feeling about school starting up? Can I get a response? That's what I would expect. Kids, how are we feeling about school starting this week if you haven't started already? Can I get a response? Wow. All right. We have some excitement. I love that. Hey, so there's a lot of transition in this time of year. And uh, as we get ready to enter into that transition, we just want to take time as a church to pray over our students, pray over the teachers in our community, uh, and just pray for the general safety of everyone as we uh, return back to school. There's a lot of things going on. And so if you would, would you just join me in prayer this morning uh, as we focus in on that? God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for just the testimonies that we saw this morning of Chris and Shaney, God, we're so thankful for uh, just the proclamation that they've made of their faith in you. God, I pray that you would be with them as they go through the next few days and weeks. God, I pray that our church body would surround them uh, with just love uh, and encouragement as we go on this journey with them. God, we also want to take time to pray for our students and teachers this morning, if there's teachers in the room. God, I pray that you would be with them uh, throughout this school year. I pray for safety. I pray for safe, uh, just classrooms and environments where our students can learn. Uh, but God, I also, I pray that our students here at PBC, uh, that they would be discipled at home, that they would learn lessons here at church, that we would surround them as a church body and a church community, that they could be a light in their school, God, that they could just impact others uh, that they're going to come in contact with this year. God, I pray that that would be an opportunity to plant a seed. I pray that they would just take that opportunity and that they would be bold in their faith, uh, that they've learned and that they would be able to share it with others, that we could see the entire Livingston County and the, and the communities around us, God, that we would just see a revival, that we would see lives turn to you and that it could start in our school systems. God, thank you so much uh, just for the people that will serve uh, at the schools. I pray for them that they would be a safe place. I pray for our teachers. I pray that you would give them strength, uh, that you would give them rest in these first couple weeks as we transition back in. God, just be with them all. And uh, God, especially just be here with us this morning. We invite your presence to still be here. We invite you, uh, your Holy Spirit, to be with us. Soften our hearts for the message this morning. And I pray that we would be able to focus in on the words that you have for us and that we could apply it to our lives throughout the week as we enter into our quiet times with you and just continue to get to know you better. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, just a couple quick announcements for you. Uh, just along the same line of students, as they're kind of exiting out, we can use this as a transition if you want. Students, you can kind of head out. Uh, just a reminder that there is only kids programming in our first service. Uh, and so if you don't have kids, you might consider coming to second service. Um, to, that service is getting a little light. Um, so again, kids programming first service. Uh, and with that, we will check out Faces of the Week. Hey, my name's Lindsay, and this is the Faces of the Week. Yes, it's Lindsay again, but with an A and not with an E. Are you ready for a busy week full of opportunities to hang out with your PBC family? Don't miss these great opportunities to meet and get to know each other. Thursday, August 23rd from 6.30 to 8.30, PBC students will kick off this new school year with an epic color war. Thursday, August 24th, also from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., PBC women will throw axes. But if this is not your thing, don't worry. There will be something for women of all ages. Axe throwing, board games, cards, and desserts great opportunity to invite a friend. Friday, August 25th, PBC Family Camp Out. Bring your tents or your camper if you have one, bedding, lawn chairs, snacks, drinks, roasting sticks, and s'more supplies for your crew. Hot dogs and buns and morning pancakes will be provided. You don't need to stay overnight if you don't want to. Just come hang out for the evening. There will be a bonfire for a nice time of fellowship and worship with our PBC family. We're looking forward to seeing you all. Have a great week, PBC.
morning, good morning. How's everybody today? The house is full, I love it. Uh, I am, uh, my name is Mark, for those that don't know. Uh, I get the privilege of being the youth pastor here, working with uh, junior high and high school students, along with uh, getting to work a little bit with discipleship here at PBC, and I love being here. Um, and here's my shameless plug. If you have students between 6th uh, grade and 12th grade, they are all invited. We want to make sure uh, these students in this, this county, this community, uh, feel the love of Jesus. And we're doing it. We're starting off with a bang. Like I said, as in all of the videos, all the colorful things, uh, there will be more than just uh, color powder flying through the air. But it will be a great time for your students if they haven't been connected very much or they've been away for the summer to reconnect, and we'd love to have them. So it's 6.30 to 8.30 uh, Wednesday night, and you won't want to miss it. I know there's other stuff with the ladies, but I'll stay off of that subject. <laughs> uh, this morning, I want to ask a more of a rhetorical question for you, but who's ever been hurt before? And there's no reason to really raise your hand, because I'm sure uh, as adults, we've all experienced this. Uh, Anybody ever held a grudge? <clears throat> what do grudges do? They cause us to be obsessed with the actions of our enemy and, and with the intentions of, of hoping that they get harmed in some way. At the same time, it becomes more of a, an emotional cancer to us where our lives are fixated on the actions of somebody else, almost as if we become the puppets to their strings. We respond in certain acts. We respond to their actions in certain ways. <clears throat> we become unforgiving. We look for ways in which they hopefully get robbed of their joy. And it's to our shame that maybe even when something does happen to that person, that individual, a smirk comes across our face going, yes, they got it. And I am no different than any of you. I've been there. And to my shame, I have let those things take root in my heart. And so this morning, we're going to talk about forgiveness. We're going to be looking at the parable of the unforgiving servant. But before we get there, I thought it was interesting also in doing research with Barna uh, back in 2019, which feels like in a century ago uh, with everything that's gone on. It says that one in four practicing Christians struggle to forgive someone. And I honestly have to admit that even there's some skepticism within me that that number is drastically higher based on how our culture has quickly become even more of a cancel culture, combative, and willing to abandon relationships. Every person has been affected by unforgiveness in one way, shape, or another, and we will be for the rest of our time here on earth. Perhaps someone offended us, someone said that something that was untrue about us, and even and, or even intentionally tried to hurt us to destroy our reputation. This may leading us to holding these deep-rooted grudges against this person. And Jesus this morning is going to open up and flip everything upside down like he normally does when he actually shares thoughts that are from heaven above and not on the earth below. Two indirect questions that we're going to not fully address, but we will uh, to think about, is that in this parable, we are going to look at uh, why do we need to forgive and how we should forgive? I think some underlying questions that Jesus lays in here. But if we could pause and just think about what have we been talking about? What are parables, right? Parables have been described as both works of art by Jesus, but also weapons in Jesus' conflict with his enemies. And it's no different here. And so when we look at this, it's important for us to grasp the, con or the context, right? The context is important. Um, in, in, in seeing this. And so I'm going to try to do this as briefly as possible, but I think it's important to look at uh, not only this parable, these few verses, but look at the whole chapter 18, which is called of, uh, one of Jesus' discourses or Jesus' teachings uh, amongst his disciples and amongst it and what he's doing here. And this one's called the Discourse of the Church. This one's in regards to the church. And when I say Matthew 18, there's probably a few verses that come to mind. 
those being from, chap- from verses 15 to 20, being in how we are to do discipline within the church. What does conflict resolution look like, right? Go to the person who offends you alone, and then, then so- if that doesn't work, bring someone with you, and if that doesn't work, take them before the church, right? And so we have this, this idea, these hard teachings in which Jesus has, but I found it very interesting that Jesus, in essence, in essence, and Matthew records this, puts a hedge, right? What do we put hedges around? Right? We, things that we want to protect, things that we want to soften, and things that we want to keep people out of, maybe. But I think it's interesting when we look at this passage, if you look at verses 10 to 14, Jesus expresses the, the heart of God and, and looking after the person and, and for the disciples to care about even the one person, right? The lost sheep. Going after the lost sheep. And then on the opposite side where we're camping out t- today, he, he brings about this whole idea of forgiveness. This whole idea where he has, has been talking about humility and that we are to be, act like children, to extend grace <clears throat> in such a way that we actually prevent legalism we prevent absolutism from happening in those moments. We offer grace in this. And so we're about to see Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, the one who's in his, his close-knit group, offer this question following Jesus making these statements. And he thinks he's being impressive. And I have to think that if you would just bear with me for a moment, as school has started, I know there might be students who have walked into their classroom to meet their new teachers and tried to impress them. I don't know if that happens. I know that maybe when I was in school that you try to start out on a good, good note and act to it like you want to impress your teacher. And here's the same idea I think I see from Peter when we look at this passage as we get ready to start the parable. He goes, hey, Jesus, how many times are we supposed to forgive somebody? He goes, seven times? Like, Brownie point, checkpoint, that's for me. And for us, it doesn't, seven doesn't mean that much to us. We know that in Scripture, seven is important. It's the number of perfection. But what we miss in the context is that three was the limited, although it's not fully, it's not recorded in the law, three was the limited amount of times that somebody was to forgive someone according to the rabbi traditions. And so Peter, if we take that into context, thinks he's impressing Jesus. I went above. I went double plus, right? I went double plus, and he goes to offer this uh, question to Jesus, thinking he's being noble and super generous. And then when he gets the answer, he responds, or if, and where we're going to start here in verse 23, Jesus completely takes even what his limited uh, approach to forgiveness and flips it upside down. So if you would, let's look at uh, verse, starting in verse 23. We're going to read uh, 23 through 27 and, and keep going through it that way this morning. And it says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who, wash, or who wished to settle accounts with his servant. When we begin to settle, when he began to settle, one, of, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay it, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife, his children, and all that he had to make payment for, for payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him of his debts. And so we see Jesus begin to make this connection. He uses the words, therefore, right? Here's, here's how your approach, Peter. Here's the rabbi's approach to forgiveness. Now here's my approach. I'm making this connection, although it's not directly the same thing. It's a different aspect of forgiveness. And we've talked about the kingdom of God being what? The kingdom of God is two aspects, right? A spiritual aspect when we allow God to rule and reign in our life. He sets up his kingdom within us. If you are a Christ follower, Christ follower, you are already part of this kingdom because he rules and reigns in your heart and life. And the second aspect, he sometimes talks about futuristically. He talks about uh, that Jesus will come again and set up his earthly kingdom. And so we're, we're going to be spending a, a lot more time again on that first aspect. 
Um, and so when we see this, there's a few people that come out, right, in the text. We have the king, we have the servant, and we have this debt. And we, we see the weight laid out before us. And so the first point is, is that the, the, the weight of debt is super important for us to understand. Now again, in reading this in our language, and, and I am no linguistic expert, but this word servant could actually have meant tax farmer, or even we could call regional manager, regional director, someone who would actually look over areas of uh, a, whole, a whole nation. And so for us going, how does a servant acquire so much debt? This is why his debt could have been so high. Although it's not key points to this sermon, it's just some questions that maybe float around in our minds. <clears throat> but here we see Jesus mention this currency. This currency that's 10,000 talents. Again, anybody operate their checkbook by talents? This, what Jesus is communicating, right? We know this. If, if we've been a part of the church and we've heard the story, we might know that this means an incalculable debt. But the talent was the highest form of currency amongst the Hebrews. And this 10,000 was one that represented an infinite. Although it is uh, mentioned in other books in the Old Testament, it also carried with it the symbolism of being an unrepayable debt. And here we see a servant who's now felt the weight. He's now had to come to the reality of the fact, this is where the rubber meets the road. The consequences lay before me. This is the debt that is in front of me. I can no longer hide it off and push back the date. I am now standing in front of the king. Here is my verdict. And what does he do? As anybody else, and as, as someone who's maybe even familiar with those um, who have experienced some of the darkest moments of life, and maybe we've asked these, or said these things ourselves, God, if you get me out of this situation, I will follow you all the days of my life. So I see this desperate plea that he makes before God, or before the king. All in which is to be symbolism, all in which is, is to... Uh, communicate, right, another message that his life is falling apart and his, his only way out, his only way out is as if this king offers him grace and forgiveness. His whole family is on the line. His whole possessions are on the line. And so here we have this stark contrast with what we face now. Putting it in reality for us is that we stand before a holy God, a God who made mankind and held him to a command, and if he held it, it brought life, and if he didn't, it brought death. And, and, they, and they ate the fruit, and it brought death, thus bringing sin through every man, through ordinary generation. Those born after them, that were, now per, that were once perfect, now stained. This is where we, found, this is where we find ourselves. This is where we become part of this, this conversation. And so I want to ask this question is that when was the last time we as a Christ follower, if you've put your trust in Christ, have felt the weight, have recalled the weight of what you've been saved from? I think far too often we minimalize this weight. I wasn't that bad. I wasn't the guy on the streets that shot up 20 people last night. I wasn't the person that, that murdered someone very violently but the very act, or even going all the way back to Genesis chapter 8 after uh, the, the flood and, and what God was making a promise with, with Noah. And he says that he would never curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. And a passage that's always stuck out to me and always... Uh, brought me back to level playing field is actually Ephesians 2, chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And it says, You were once dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom 
We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is the playing field. This is what Jesus is communicating, although it's actually not even the, the very core principle. It plays a huge part in what we're talking about this conversation of forgiveness we see that there's a weight for our sin we see that there's a weight that we need to be reminded of and the fact that in in psalms 103 it says that he is not he does not deal with us and according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities because of christ because of christ and so as followers of christ and those maybe even this morning maybe feeling the weight of our own sin we have to realize, and I want us to see this beautiful act that's about to happen, this act of mercy, this act of grace of this king, what it means for you and I. So if we revisit and go back to verse 26, he says, The servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him his debt. It was a simple request. It wasn't a bunch of hoops. It wasn't anything else. But he found, it says, that the king had compassion on him. And we, have, we know from Scripture that God has had compassion on us because you and I, no matter how we were, we were rebels against God. And out of his mercy, his compassion, his grace, you and I have been redeemed and can be redeemed because of the finished work of Christ. Finishing that verse that I, was, I just shared in Ephesians chapter 2, the favorite part is this, but God being rich in mercy with the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in, the, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. And not works of not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This is what we have. This has got to be the very root of our forgiveness. Is the fact that we have to understand and begin to catch the glimpse of the weight of our own sin and what we've been rescued from, in order that from that we might then forgive others. True, genuine forgiveness can only come when we understand that we've been forgiven. You're going to hear me probably say that over and over and over again. But the cross purchased your forgiveness. The cross purchased your forgiveness. And if this isn't in line, forgiving someone, getting rid of a grudge, isn't going to, going to, you're not going to get it figured out. Running to Jesus is going to be the only one, only way. So how can we be forgiven? Forgiving is... It's not just, it, this, there's these misconceptions that forgiveness is that I forget, and, right? That I forgive and I forget. And what Jesus is saying is that he doesn't hold it, just like he doesn't hold it against us because of Christ, that, that we are not to hold it against ourselves or against others, other people around us. So this servant who then has experienced the greatest moment of his life, quite frankly, is now uh, brought to, he leaves the king's courts. And we see a heart that has not been changed. Meaning that even though he experienced mercy, even though he felt the weight of his sin, he felt mercy, he acted in pride and ignorance. Going to verse 28, when, when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. This, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will repay you. And he refused and put him in prison till he should pay him. We're told in the text that this servant immediately leaves this moment of greatness, this moment of freedom for him, and turns around and goes after someone 
And so what I didn't fail to mention is that this numbers, if we want to do, if you're sitting here, maybe even as a counting person or someone who likes numbers, not me, you look at the weight in which the separation at the beginning and the end of this, this parable. This 10,000 10, talents would be equivalent up to about a billion dollars. He then gets freed from that, that, uh, that debt, right, with nothing he has to owe. There's no payment plan. And he goes after a guy who owes him $20. The equivalent of about 100 days' work. If we find later on in the book of Matthew that a denarii was, was a one day's wages, so about 100 days' wages, equivalent today at about $20. So he, he then, in his own flesh, whether he's trying to just get even, whether he's acting out of his insecurities, whether he's uh, just flat out being mean, or thinks he's going to try to earn this. He's earned his way. He's going to try to get the king back. He's laid before, it, it's laid before, and he just, he, he just is ruthless. He's outrageous. And this is so much what can happen in our own sinfulness. Right? When we get hurt, we can tend to latch out and, and hurt somebody else. But perhaps, as one uh, commentator put it, perhaps our Savior by this meant to teach that the offenses of our fellow man commit against us are very small and insignificant with our offenses against God. Since God has forgiven us so much, we ought to forgive each other of the small offenses we are committed, which are committed. He didn't understand grace. He hurt others because he was unforgiving. We don't know, right? And that's the point of parables, is that not all the details are included. It's a streamlined story. But for some reason, the servant was forgiven, but left the king unchanged. And, and this might be in some situations as a youth pastor, working with students and working with parents, and understanding as, as students come uh, this, that conflict arises in this continued battle back and forth of, of being hurt and unforgiveness, where unforgiveness is, or where unforgiveness is, bitterness grows deep. And we see that both, uh, I've seen that both parties are affected, both people are affected, and whether it was a, a fight on the way here in the car, trying to get everybody to church, or a fight with a spouse, or whatever, the growing Resentment we begin to hold against one another. Our pride keeps us from seeking out forgiveness. This servant believed that he had something to prove, that he had to make it clear, that he was trying to make himself look better. And Jesus finishes this parable with this idea, this uh, this last principle, which really could encompass the rest or the, this whole section. The very heart of forgiveness begins with the heart. Looking at verses 32 through 35 here, it said, Then the servant summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I gave you, or I forgave you all the debt because you pled with me and showed no mercy. Or, and should not you, and should you not have held, had mercy on your fellow servant as I have mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him over to jailers until he could pay all of his debt. So, and so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. It is, it is completely solely depend. Or sorry. I went off the scripture here. <laughs> Excuse me. These last three words, from your heart, from your heart, lay out that there is this, it's a, it's, forgiveness has to begin with our hearts, and a heart that's been transformed. On, a, on God's merciful act upon us, and it allows us to, in essence, uh, be able to forgive those who are beside us, that hurt us, that bring pain to us. 
Forgiving others is the practice. Excuse me. Forgiving others is the product of a genuine Christian. One who is controlled by the Spirit, the very fruit of what comes from a follower of Christ is one of forgiveness. This, in essence, is what Jesus is communicating over and over and over again. Forgiving others is becoming like Jesus. Like Ephesians 4.32 tells us, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you. Along with malice, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Forgiveness is hard, though, isn't it? If we're truly honest, we have these misconceptions. We have what our culture tells us, that forgiveness, seeking forgiveness is weak. We have forgive and forget, but how do we forget, right? If we think about it, if someone starts to forget something, we recognize that something is wrong, and they need to get help. And so that we know that as humans, it's really hard for us, outside of the grace of God, that might, he might take some of that away, that we are going to remember these things. But we have to remember that we have the opportunity to testify to what God has done in the forgiveness for us and that we no longer hold that person against us, hold it against that person we come in contact with. There's also a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. One commentator puts it this way, the true reconciliation of a relationship can only happen when both parties are agreeable to it. This may require repentance of, on one or both of the parties in the conflict, yet forgiveness can be one-sided. Forgiveness can be a one-way one street of seeking forgiveness with your Heavenly Father. Reconciliation is a two-way street. And these things that we have to remember when, when, when thinking about this whole topic of forgiveness, whether we've been taught this way or we've been looking at it, Understanding that the very core of our forgiveness comes from the fact of what we've been redeemed from. Forgiveness is to be the standard operating procedure for all believers. And so I've come up with a few steps, and this by no means is all that I have created, but I know that from myself and my moments of deepest, darkest pain, deepest, darkest pain, uh, moments of life where I didn't know if I could forgive someone because of the pain and hurt that uh, came down to these three things. They're, they're going to be brief, but I hope that this is at least encouraging as we look at this. And what we've, like we've been talking about already is remembering the fact of what we've been forgiven from. We are never going to hurt someone more than we've already offended God. Our God is holy and when we come back to this, when we're struggling to forgive somebody, we have to come back to the very root that we've been forgiven. If we don't come to the root that we have been forgiven, the rest of it is just words on a page. One of the things that a mentor told me for the next one is that this is not rocket science. But it begins this conversation with we talk to God first, right? We talk about one of these things as our core values is we talk to God first. And bringing before God this, uh, that God would open our hearts to be able to forgive this person. That God would soften our hearts as we look even at his words and he, when he taught his disciples how to pray, the only thing that he expanded upon was that of, of forgiving the trespasses of the other. In verses 14 and 15, excuse me, he says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. These things that Jesus lays out here, this opportunity for us to then ask God to do a work, to take our heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh, that we would begin to be changed like Him. Thirdly, is that you might need to write a journal. I don't know if you journal. I don't know if, what this looks like. But express hurts and anger, and this by no means is going on Facebook. This by no means is going anywhere. This is, this is between you and God. This is you 
putting it out. And if you need to talk to a trusted counselor, trust, trusted being, right? This isn't gossip. This, isn't, this is just confiding in a friend. This is accountability. This is doing life in community in which we're all about, right? This whole idea of, of the community of the church and what God has designed us to do is not to do this alone. Lastly, we finally, we get to the point where we make the decisions that I forgive you. And so the next time I come in contact with you, I'm no longer holding it against you that you stole 20 bucks from me. That you took a tool from me. That you lied to me. I forgive you. And so I'm able to not look at this offense. And where it's possible, like I said, reconciliation is a two-way street, right? It doesn't always happen. And a lot of times we run to reconciliation before we run to forgiveness. And so remembering that we run to forgiveness with first found in Jesus, and then from there burst forth uh, Lord willing reconciliation. And I think of this, this quote of uh, what was recorded about uh, a guy named uh, George Whitefield in the 1700s. He was a great evangelist and man of God, once uh, received a, a spiteful letter accusing him of all sorts of wrongs in his ministry. Winfield returned a, a brief, returned a brief, courteous reply that stands as an example to anyone who is criticized and accused by others. I thank you heartily for your letter, he wrote. As for, as for what you and my enemies are saying against me, I know things about m- myself I know worse things about myself than you have said about me. With love, in Christ, George Whitfield, Whitefield. When you live a life of constantly walking with Jesus, confession and repentance is going to continue to overflow. It's going to become more natural. It's going to be something that, just like uh, riding a bike and moving in, that when we begin to take these decisions, when we run to the foot of Jesus, when we run to the foot of the cross, these things he begins to open. It doesn't make it easy. And just because we're talking about this topic of forgiveness, I by no means think that I am fully covering every aspect of forgiveness. And it's just so important for us to see that it's, it's got to be a God genuinely taking our heart of stone and taking it to a heart of flesh, taking what was uh, pain and and drawing us into him. I believe with all my heart that many of us here have allowed unforgiveness, unforgiven sin to rot away our joy. We can choose to forgive, and God commands us to forgive. Therefore, if there is something we can do, sometimes we have to lay our emotions aside and begin to and focus in on what the truth is. That we have been forgiven. And because you have been forgiven, the product of that is that you are eager to then forgive others. Or even yourself. So thinking about this, have you embraced genuine forgiveness from Christ? Do you believe that you have been forgiven of what is public, what is secret from Christ. Because it's only when genuine, genuine forgiveness can only take place when we come to the realization of how much we've been forgiven. Genuine forgiveness can only truly take place when we come to the realization of how much we've been forgiven. Otherwise, it simply is superficial forgiveness. And I have to confess, I'm by no means standing up here as a perfect example. This isn't always easy. And I'm not claiming that it is. But our life as Christ followers is ongoing surrender and letting Christ reign in our hearts, right? I'm going to leave you with this, this quote from a guy named Vodi Bakum that I think summarizes this whole thing. There'll be, there'll be people moving, and that's totally okay. We will either be people who are characterized by a piled-up forgiveness 
or piled up bitterness. It is one or the other. There's no middle ground here. We're either piled up, eager to forgive people because of what Christ has done, or the bitterness will continue to grow deeper and rooted, whether it's between a husband and a wife, a brother and a sister, family, friends, whatever it might be. One of those is a picture of redemption that you have in Christ, and it's glorious as it is displayed. The other makes a mockery of what Jesus did on the cross. Would you with me seek to find and to recall what we've been redeemed from, what we've been forgiven from, that we can run to Jesus and that would allow and produce within us a heart for others to forgive? Would you pray with me? Father, you are so good. What we don't understand is that you and your grace and mercy have lavished on us that your plan from eternity past to redeem us, to save us from ourselves, that the heart of man is evil from, young, from the time of our youth. And yet in your grace, you sent Jesus to save us, to rescue us, that from this forgiveness that we are allowed then to truly have deep forgiven community and met grace with those around us. Father, would you help us to cling to forgiveness? Would you help us to be merciful people all for the sake of glorifying you, that we might be a display in this dark and hurting world that grace and truth and hope is found only in you. In Jesus' name.
Chris, got to show your hand again. BBC, remember you are loved, you are sent. God bless you. Have a great week.